Hey, what a great way to segue into the next part of our morning together this morning. We are, I'll use the word again, so excited about Family Church Sunday, the start of VBS, our picnic today. It's going to be a great day, and I want you to just listen for a second. How cool is that? So kids, teens, we are so glad you're with us in the room. Uh, My job in the next few minutes is to teach and give the adults uh, an abbreviated version of the next woman that we're studying in our summer sermon series, that's Hannah. And then after that, Miss Megan is going to come and have a special, special message for the kids. So we're going to try and do that sort of back to back, and then we'll continue on with our morning after that. Um, we're going to look at Hannah this morning, as I've said, and you can find the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2. She is the mom, eventually, of Samuel, and she experienced one of those most profound and private and excruciating uh, experiences of inner turmoil and suffering a woman can experience, and that's the inability to have, her, to have a child. In our brief look at her this morning, we're going to see that she has amazing trust in God and faith and, and grace under pressure. We'll also see that she is holy even in her complaint as she comes to the Lord, and ultimately, as we've already sort of given you the, the out, the end here, uh, God, God delivers her. God really blesses her. So we'll also, of course, try to make application from her example into our own lives. Before we do that, why don't I pray? God, we come to you this morning, as we have a couple times already, just bringing you ourselves. We bring you the noise of this room, the kids, the adults, the older folks, the younger folks. Lord, we're so excited to be worshiping together. Would you help us to hear the things that we need to hear this morning from you, that we might become more like your son, Jesus? It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Now, before we read this morning, we're going to be starting 1 Samuel chapter 1. I want to tell you, if you're a little kid today, during my part, you can get out that uh, bulletin that you were given. You can color on it. You can do the activities. You can draw funny pictures of me, whatever you need to do. You're certainly allowed to listen as well. Uh, And then, like I said, Miss Megan will be coming in a minute. So let's begin in verse 1. It says, There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zophite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. So first we see, indeed, Hannah is childless. She's also distraught over this, and she's further burdened by this the, the uh, circumstances of her family, burdened by bigamy, if you will. Now, what's bigamy? Bigamy is having more than one wife, or two wives in this case. And this was not God's plan. It's not the way God designed the family, and it immediately caused problems. In fact, in other passages in the Bible where there's bigamy and polygamy, you'll find it always causes problems. And so we have a dysfunctional family relationship, and, and Peninnah takes the opportunity I guess, to make her feel even better about herself, to bully and mock and pick on Hannah, who's unable to have a child. It's probable that Elkanah took this second wife, Peninnah, because Hannah was unable to give him a baby. And so you can only imagine that added to her torment, her inner torment, her sense of security and so on and so forth. But this woman showed tremendous grace under these pressures under the pressure that, of feeling inadequate, especially in this culture and in this time, but really in any time, and unable to have a child, and then secondly, with the bullying that she was living under. Well, you may not have the same exact experience in your family, in your life, but I would guess, venture to guess, if we asked each person to share, you could tell stories of situations of, of dysfunction in our extended families, maybe even immediate families at times, that caused us to feel a little angst. And the question for us, for you and for me is, in, that, in those times, do we respond with grace under pressure or do we lash out? Now, we're going to look at why Hannah was so gracious under pressure 
uh, this morning. We, we start to pick that up in verse 9. Verse 9 says, Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. And so she prays to the Lord, and she prays in an attitude of worship. She's worshipful in her desires, and she's also holy in her complaint. She doesn't, she doesn't respond sinfully or in sinful anger, but she comes with a raw soul and says to the Lord, Lord, would you please look on my suffering, look on my misery, And then she makes this vow. There's worship and holiness in everything that she's doing, and she brings her pain to the Lord. But at the same time, she invites the Lord into her pain somehow. Now, I'll be honest with you. I mean, maybe that's really obvious. I hope it is. I don't know exactly what Hannah felt. I'm not a woman. I haven't experienced what she went through. Uh, And a couple months ago, as I was beginning to think about her and looking ahead in the preaching schedule, knowing that I was going to be speaking on Hannah, I reached out to a couple women I know who have walked the path that Hannah has walked. And I asked them, I said, you know, would you be so kind as to just kind of, what what were you feeling during that season of your life? What was it like to walk through the same road that Hannah was walking? And they were gracious enough to send me lengthy responses of what was going on in their minds and their hearts and the turmoil and their walks with Jesus and so on and so forth. Now, some of the threads that you can see in Hannah's, uh, in the prayers she prays, in the bitterness she felt, so on and so forth, definitely rang true with the testimonies of, of these women. Things like feeling inadequate or unworthy before the Lord. Things like being frustrated and even angry at times. Uh, envy over others who are having children, so on and so forth. Those are kind of the negative things that were the same. But the amazing thing to me that as I read these two testimonies, that the thread that tied them to Hannah thousands of years ago was a deep, honest, brutally honest, but reverent prayer life. And that this event in their life galvanized their walk with God and drove them deep in their relationship with God. Tremendously helpful to have the perspective of someone who's lived this. You see, Hannah's pain was very real. And I love this phrasing that she essentially, she prayed her soul to the Lord. And she gave him everything. The longing in Hannah's heart, the longing of a woman who deeply desires to have a child, we need to say explicitly, is, is a unique longing in human experience. It just is. But it's still fair for us to apply that to longings that we might all have in our lives. Maybe it's an unrequited love or an unrealized dream. Maybe it's an unfulfilled promise to you. Maybe an unmet goal. What what are the longings of your heart this morning? Where have sin's effects in a fallen world affected your world, left you even offended or upended in your life? Where has that happened to you? And the big question is, of course, how have you responded? Have you responded in bitterness, withdrawal from God, rebellion, or like Hannah, running to him, bringing him everything you've got, praying your soul, essentially? Psalm 140 verse 6 tells us, I said to the Lord, you are my God, give ear to the voice of my supplications. And the psalmist says resolutely, essentially, you're my God, so I'm bringing all of this to you. That's what we're encouraged to do as we look at the example of Hannah, to declare, God, you're my God, and so I'm going to bring everything I've got, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and allow you to do your work. Are we worshipful in our desires and holy in our complaint? Well, that brings us to the the exciting part. Uh, Again, I kind of spoiled it in the beginning, but Hannah gets pregnant. Verse 19, they're still in Shiloh and it says, early the next morning they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then they went back to their home in Ramah and in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel saying, because I asked the Lord for him. 
Now, there's an interesting sort of evolution in the relationships here. First, the, the Scripture says in the beginning of the chapter, the Lord closed Hannah's womb. The Lord did. And it says, because, if you look at the text, because of this, uh, Peninnah, the other wife, mocked her, bullied her, essentially. Because Peninnah bullies Hannah, Elkanah comes to the aid of his wife. Albeit, if you read the, the chapter, not with the greatest amount of sensitivity. But he comes alongside of his wife and tries to defend her or encourage her as best he can. Because he does such a lousy job, she then goes to the Lord. And the Lord opens her womb. Very interesting uh, turn of events in the relationships here. But Heron, Hannah's barrenness is certainly about her relationship with God privately, personally, and God's deliverance and blessing to her in giving her Samuel, but it's much more than that. It's also about his redemption for all mankind. Now, Samuel means God has heard or God hears, something like that. What's, what's particularly fascinating is Samuel is kind of like the next generation's Moses. He's the last judge in the time of the judges. He's also the first prophet in the time of the prophets in the time of the kings. He fills this sort of dual role, and he's this iconic figure that comes on the scene. And if you think back to God's calling on Moses, God calls Moses out of the desert in Midian, and what does he say from the burning bush? He says, the cry of my people has reached my ears, and so he sends Moses. And hear the cry of this woman who deeply desires to have a baby, becomes the vehicle by which God demonstrates that he hears not just her, but the need of his whole people. It's a fascinating, fascinating point. Well, that brings us to Hannah's promise. Hannah has made this promise to the Lord that if God gives her a child, she will give him back to the Lord. And the Nazarite vow that she speaks of here was generally a temporary thing, a season of, of a, a man, young man's life. She and the parents of Samson in the scriptures make it permanent, which is really interesting. But listen to what the text says. It says, after he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, and this time that's probably about three or four years old, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And she says to Eli, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked for, for, of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. Hannah is faithful to her word. Now you have to imagine that there was a time in this whole process as she's carrying the child, as she has the child, where she thinks, wow, this is a significant promise I've made. Can I really deliver on this promise? But she's faithful to her word and selfless in her parenting. Now, I have to confess to you that I've probably read that a, a bazillion times in my lifetime, and I kind of read over it quickly. But I began to really think on what she did. And I thought, well, we've got a bunch of children in the room this morning. Why don't we pretend? What if we were to pretend this morning uh, and sort of recreate that? What if the staff here at GBC, didn't just work at the church, but what if we lived here seasonally on and off? Now, some of the staff will tell you it feels like they do live here. But I want to pick on uh, Pastor Frank this morning. Pastor Frank, if you could come up onto the stage. Let's pretend for the sake of our illustration this morning that Pastor Frank not only works at GBC, but he lives here. And let's say that a family who's very devoted to the Lord wants to give their son to the Lord's work here at GBC. And we'll pick on the Gamble family this morning. Let's say that they wanted to give their son, Tyler, to God's work at the chapel. And so Tyler came to live and work here. This is what she did. Now, they lived a great distance from Shiloh, and they would, the Scripture tells us they went up at least once a year to see him, maybe more frequent that the Bible doesn't tell us. But this is what she did. This is the gravity of what she did, not knowing if she would have other children. And we're to raise our children to release them, not literally, physically, like in this context. But think about the weight of that. Okay, guys, you can come back out. Hey, give them a hand, will you? 
Thank you, guys. Well done. Thank you, Tyler. Nice job, buddy. You can go sit with your folks. I'll only make you do that one more time. <laughs> Hannah raises Samuel to release him. Moms and dads, that's our job. We're stewards. We're caretakers. We raise our children to equip them, to release them to the Lord. A great lesson from Hannah's life. Well, that brings us to our final section here. That's Hannah's praise. This amazing prayer of praise, I encourage you to read it in your own time. It's actually a template of Mary's prayer, her Magnificat in Luke chapter 1. We're going to read three verses, the first two and the last one. She prays this after giving Samuel over to the Lord. She says, my heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Last verse. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Hannah, in her praise and in her prayers, demonstrates that she, especially for a woman at this time in this culture, has a well-developed theology. She knows much about God. Her prayers, this one and the one earlier, reveal a deep understanding of God's purposes and of his character. She knows them intimately. But she finds her joy in the Lord as well. And it's not just that she knows about him. She knows him. It begs the question of us, do we just know about God or do we know him? It's quite possible to have a degree in theology and not have a relationship with the God of the universe. Hannah found her joy in God. Her prayer reflects a deep desire, not just for personal satisfaction, but for God's larger redemptive plan as she prays at the end that the king, the Lord's anointed, would come to be. And Hannah was blessed by God because she knew him. Meaning Hannah was blessed not just in the giving of Samuel that eventually came, but there was blessing in the fact that she knew God and experienced joy in relationship with him. Hannah's story has a happy ending. Hannah not only has a child, she eventually has several more children. And life doesn't always go this way. The Samuel baby doesn't always come. But when viewed from the lens of eternity, and we read passages like 1 Peter 1 that says essentially that the trials and sufferings of this life cannot compare to the inheritance that is ours in Christ Jesus. Or this verse in 2 Corinthians 4, for our momentary light affliction, all of life's trials it calls momentary and light affliction, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. John Piper said in his book, Desiring God, he took a twist of this kind of famous old, old saying. He said, the sole purpose of man is to glorify God, and the old way of saying it would be, and to uh, enjoy him forever. John Piper says, by enjoying him forever. This is what Hannah had. This is the lesson of her life. Hannah's story is about longing, something we all know and experience. But it's about longing fulfilled, and the lesson of her life is that she directed glory to God in her heights and in her depths. And in her depths, even in her pain, he was enough. I dare say as well that God found joy in blessing her with Samuel. And that brings us to the next part of our morning. All right, kids. If it's okay with your moms and dads, in a moment, Miss Megan and I are going to switch places, and you guys can come down and fill this area here, and Miss Megan has a special message for you on this little boy, Samuel. Go ahead. You can come on up. Good morning, everybody. You are about as quiet as the kids at first service. So let's have the adults and everybody downstairs hear you. Good morning, everybody.
That was a little bit better. One more time. Ready? One, two, three. Good morning. That was good. Good job. Okay, so have you guys ever wanted a toy really, really badly? Like more than anything else in the whole wide world, you just wanted a new something. Oh, some people already got what they wanted, or just lost teeth. Wonderful. <laughs> so Pastor Gary just came up, and he told us about Hannah and how she wanted a baby more than anything else in the whole wide world. And she prayed, and she prayed to God that he would give her a baby. And what did she pray? What did she promise God she would do after, if God gave her a baby? She promised that she would give him back, that she would give him back to God so that he could do God's work. When you thought about that toy that you really, really wanted, did you think, if mom and dad give that to me, I'm going to give that toy back to mom and dad? Probably not, right? But Hannah did. Hannah made a promise with God, and she loved her son Samuel so much, but she also loved God and wanted to keep her promise, and she did. So I'm going to give, I'm going to ask you guys a couple questions to see if you were paying attention to Pastor Gary. So, and don't, don't, oh, it's not even up there yet. Good. Okay. What was Hannah's son's name? What's the little boy's name? Samuel. Good job. And how did Hannah keep her promise? Where did Samuel go to live? Where did Samuel go to live? We pretended that he went, go ahead. He went to live kind of with God. He went to live at the church, right? And about how old was he, do you think? Three or four. Good job. Good job. All right, so let's find out what happens to Samuel next. Samuel has been living at the church with Eli, And when he's about 12 years old, God has a very special job for him. So we're going to look in our Bibles at 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 4 to 10 and 19 to 21. So Samuel was getting ready to go to sleep. Oh, boys, can we sit up? There we go. We were, Samuel was getting ready to go to sleep. And then all of a sudden, the Lord called to Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. So he went and lied down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli. And again, Eli said, my son, I did not call you, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. I have a toy in a few minutes. Wonderful. I'm so happy you got your toy. The Lord came and stood there as the other times. Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, your servant is listening. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh. And there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. So, What's happening in this part of the Bible? God has a plan for Samuel, even when he was young. God was going to make Samuel a prophet and was going to give people messages from God. This was an important job. It was an urgent plan. How many times did God call Samuel? How many? Three? Yep, he did. God didn't wait to call Samuel 
until he was older. He didn't wait until he was a grown-up. He called Samuel when he was just a little boy. And he didn't call him once, but he called him three times. Samuel continued to learn and grow. He didn't just follow what the he didn't just say that he knew what was going on because the Lord had talked to him. He decided to keep learning who God was and keep growing. So let's see what you remember. What did Samuel say each and every time the Lord called him? He said three words afterwards. What did he say? Um, he said, um, um, he said um, um, How about, can somebody help him? What did he say? He said, here I am. Good job. So Samuel was willing. He wasn't afraid of what God was going to do. He was ready to listen to God. Samuel was faithful like his mom. In Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. <laughs> if you trust in God, he's going to show you what you're going to do. So what does this mean for you guys? How old are you guys? Two, nine, six, nine, seven. Okay. God, you are not too young for God to use you. You guys are five. That's great. Okay, let's put our listening ears back on. Let's put our listening ears back on. God can use you even how old you are right now. First Timothy 4.12 says, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. So you guys can be an example for the grown-ups, just like Samuel. And God wants to know you and for you to know him, like Samuel's mom Hannah and Samuel did. This reminds me of, of another story in the Bible. Can you guys tell me who else let their son do God's work? Um, um, he, um, Jesus. Good job, TJ. God did. God let his son come down from heaven so that we could learn more about who God was because God wants a relationship with us, right? So... What is going to happen this week? Does anybody know? What, why is the stage decorated like this? VBS, Vacation Bible School. So all this week, we are going to learn about following Jesus, the light of the world, and how Jesus came down from heaven so that we could have a relationship with God. You guys did a really good job listening for the whole service. It's almost been an hour. You guys did a great job. So as a little special treat, you guys stay here, but we're going to stand up, and we're going to have all the adults stand up too, and we're going to teach you, you guys can follow along and watch us, our first VBS song that we're going to do this week. Are you ready?
Jesus wherever he will lead me. I'm gonna follow Jesus all the way. I'm gonna follow Jesus wherever he will lead me. I'm gonna follow Jesus all the way. He is the light that breaks through the darkness. Follow his lead and light.